and turn with me to the book of Joshua, the fifth chapter. Be reading verses 13 through 15. That was a beautiful special, Sister Brown. Yeah, that was a, that was a great special. And uh, sometimes people ask me, are you ready? Just before I get up and preach. Or when I get to church and I say, I'm not ready till it's over. Yeah. Because preaching is always an adventure. And uh, I'm always people interested to see what's, what's going to be said. Well, so am I. You know, you can plan a sermon ever so carefully. And I do try to pray and study and plan a sermon. But so many times it just doesn't go as you think it's going to go or it just doesn't follow the plan that you have for it. Sometimes you think that's uh, not good. I preached sermons when I thought it was the worst sermon I ever preached. And probably was. And someone would come get saved. I preached sermons that I thought was just really maybe the best sermon I ever preached. And I don't know about that. But I'd rather preach when God uses me than when I feel good. So it's always an adventure. But in uh, Joshua, the, chip, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? <clears throat> and he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I come, am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's go to the Lord. Our Father, we, we bow before you this morning, and we are thankful for this church service. And thankful for every church service going on across America where the Bible is, is preached and taught. And Lord, we just glorify thy precious name this morning. And we pray that all across this country, you would help Americans to repent of their sins. For we know that we need revival. And we know that what hinders revival is sin. So help us that we can all look into our heart. Help us that we can search our soul. Help us that we can get right with God and repent of our sins and live for Jesus Christ. And we praise thee for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach on the subject, the captain of the Lord's host. Joshua chapter 1 through chapter 6 have to be read together. Now, chapter divisions are there, and they're very helpful, but sometimes if we allow them to, they break a thought, and we need to be able to read on through that thought. And you need to read chapter 1 through chapter 6, especially chapter 5 and chapter 6 together. Moses had died. That happens. Here was a great man of God, the greatest man in the Old Testament, had died. And he had to be replaced. That's not easy. It's hard to fill a great man of God's shoes. But God did call Joshua to take his place. Now, Joshua was not Moses, but he was the man that had the qualifications for the next step in Israel's adventure. And so God filled that, filled that Moses' seat with a man who had the qualifications. And we need to understand that when God puts a person there, he's the person who's supposed to be there. So he had, he had, put, he had put Joshua there, and it was Joshua's job to lead the children of Israel across the Jordan River into the Promised Land and to conquer it and, and to possess it. Joshua had led the people into the land. They crossed the Jordan, and they were somewhere about halfway, roughly halfway between the northern border and the southern border. And the Lord had done a mighty miracle. When, he, when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River, God had parted the Jordan River, just like he did the Red Sea. And he, had, he did that for two reasons. First of all, for the children of Israel to know that God was with them. It is so important for us to know that God is with us. 
I hope you know that this morning. And if, if, if you're right with God, you can know that for sure. He is with you. And if we're not right with God, we need to get right with God. So we can know that He walks with us every step of the way. And He also did that to confirm that Joshua was the leader He had chosen. So the Lord opened uh, the Jordan River, just like the Red Sea. Upon approximately, and I don't know what the number was about this time, they left Egypt with about three million people altogether. Approximately three million people uh, made their first camp at a place that they, that they called Gilgal. And the meaning of Gilgal is rolling away or rolling off. Now they had rolled, the Lord said he had rolled the reproach of the Egyptians off of them this day. We're not sure what he meant by that. It may have meant that, you know, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they many times said, it had been better if you'd have left us in Egypt. It'd been better if you'd have left us back there. It's so tough out here. It's so rough out here. It'd been better. You know, let's don't do that. Let's don't, let's don't do that. Where God takes us is where he wants us to be. He's got a purpose. And if, we're, if you're in a valley right now and you're having to go through a deep valley, God's got you there. He's placed you there for a purpose. And so it may have been that when the Lord brought them across the Jordan River, planted their feet on the promised land, he said, see, I told you I would get here. I rolled the, the, the shame of the Egyptians off of you this day. So it was, it was here at Gilgal uh, that Joshua had this uh, Christophany. And a Christophany means an, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And Jesus did appear in the Old Testament many times before he was born of the Virgin Mary. Here he is seen as the angel of the Lord. Now everywhere you see that term, the angel of the Lord, does not mean that is Christ. But there are places that we can be sure that it was actually Jesus Christ who took upon him a human form and appeared to different people in the Old Testament. And most of the time it is by the term the angel of the Lord. So Joshua had this, this Christophany, if I'm pronouncing that right. I've never been good on big words. So in this chapter 5, in our text, it's clear that this cannot be an angel. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we're looking at this morning is that picture. When there in the Old Testament, whenever the children of Israel went into the promised land, Jesus was there to meet them. Joshua met Jesus on the plains of Jericho. In Joshua chapter 5, verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? I would title this, Joshua meets Jesus. In the Old Testament, the name Jesus is pronounced Joshua. In the Hebrew, it's, it's, it's Joshua. Jesus is Joshua. And vice versa. In the New Testament, it's pronounced Jesus. And so we have, really, if you, if you uh, there's five Jesuses in the Bible. Four in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. And if you follow those through, you will find types of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, really, if you'd have been really sharp, really in tune with God, really close to God, it would have been uh, possible, I think, to know actually the name of the Messiah before he came because God had revealed him in the Old Testament. At least that's, that's my thought. Now, we're, we're not given the name of this person who appeared to Joshua. As I said, he's called the angel of the Lord. But we have conclusive proof here, and I'll get to that in a little while, that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua fell down and worshiped him. In Joshua chapter 5, verse 14, And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? So this cannot be an angel. Everywhere in the Bible where someone tried to worship an angel, they were forbidden to do that. We have two places over in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, 10, chapter 22, 8 where John was so impressed with this angelic being, the glory of this being that was speaking to him and giving him this information, that he fell down and, and, and started to worship. And the angel said, get up and see thou do it not. He said, I am just like you are. I am not God. 
God is the only one we worship. And isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is the second person of the Trinity, that He came and died on the cross for us, that He shed His, His sinless blood for you and I so we can know for sure that we're saved. We're not worshiping a created being. Some of the cults try to say that Jesus Christ is a created being. If he's a created being, he is not worthy to pay the price for our sin. Jesus Christ came. The Son of God came and died on the cross so you and I could be saved. What a wonderful thing this morning. What a wonderful thing. We come to church every, every week and we don't stop and think about it sometimes. But what we're really celebrating every Sunday, we do it once a year, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But actually every Sunday... We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ because in His resurrection, we know that if we are saved and we know the Lord is our Savior, we are going to be raised. I read many long years ago a thought that has really helped me. He said, you know, they killed Jesus Christ and He wouldn't stay dead and neither will we. Isn't that a great thought? We're going, you know, what can they do to a Christian? The, I've always said the only way, the only way a Christian can be defeated is if he quits. Young people, if you're out in the world and, and we pray this will never happen, but you, you would backslide and you would, uh, you would do something that's horrible and, and Satan would get you down and see, he'd get you down and say, see, you're worthless. You're no good. There's no place in God's kingdom. You've blown it. Don't you believe that? The only way the devil, once you're bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ is if you take out on God. He'll never take out on you. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God will always be there. And don't you let the devil tell you that Jesus can't forgive you. He shed his blood on the cross to save you. And if he shed his blood on the cross to save you, his blood will also forgive you whenever, after you're a Christian, no matter what. But let's try to live for the Lord. Amen? We don't want to get ourselves in that position. But you see, this is not just an angel. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. We're going, Joshua saw him there in the Old Testament. We and all of God's people are going to see him. In fact, at the second advent of Jesus Christ, the whole world is going to see him. And so we are going to be, have the opportunity folks, and we ought to always keep this before the church. Always keep this before our young people. We are in this veil of tears. Life has some good times to it. Have you ever been in a place in life where you thought, boy, heaven couldn't be much better than this? There are times, aren't there, that's, that God gives us that's really good, but heaven is better. And, this, and, the, and the, the good times we have in this life don't last. They soon fade away. The good times we have in heaven are going to last for eternity. So heaven is a wonderful place, and we need to keep it in front of a, all of us that we're here for a while. Let's, because we're here, this is a preparation ground. This is a basic training camp. And so we need to live for the Lord. If it requires sacrifice, if it requires suffering, let's, let's live for the Lord because we're going to heaven and we're going on, we're going on a, a eternal vacation. We're never going to come back. Praise the Lord. We're going to live with God throughout all eternity. You know, uh, as I said, we don't worship anything or anyone. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. We don't worship idols. Now, uh, uh, and that's why we don't worship angels. And, you know, there are, there are people who do. The Roman Catholic Church and others use images in, in their worship. They bow down to statues. They use relics. Uh, they have statues of Christ. They have statues of Mary. Uh, they have statues of the saints. They have pictures. And the early church uh, fought a real battle over this, the iconic uh, uh, battle. And they, they had several meetings over it. They battled back and forth between this. And there were those who believed that it was okay to have these icons in their worship and these statues and things like that. The other side said no. Now the, the, side who, who, the side who bowed down to these icons said, we're not worshiping them. We're using them only as a teaching. But the side that said that you shouldn't have icons said, no, that's the same thing as idolatry. You cannot say you're just using those things because the Lord said we're not supposed to do that. 
Well, there was a big battle over that. They had several uh, meetings over that. And so uh, finally in 787, those who, who believed in icons won out because they, they had, I can't remember the word I'm trying to use right now, but they had a meeting and uh, they, uh, they made it wrong for anyone to object to using statues and relics and things like that in their worship. So you could, have been, you could have been in trouble for that. I want you to turn with me to Numbers chapter 33, verse 52. Numbers 33, 52. And I want to read a scripture to you there. It's just uh, Numbers, let me get there, 33. Well, I'm glad I'm not trying to find this verse in a hurry. Numbers 33, 52. I had it marked. Okay. Then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite pluck down all their high places. Now this was what God was giving them instruction when they went into the promised land. There were people there who were people who did not worship God. They worshiped idols. And so God, when he went in, when he took the children of Israel in under Joshua, said, you go in and you destroy everything. Man, woman, children, animals. Well, the only thing you keep alive is what I tell you to. And you don't keep the relics and you don't keep the pictures that they have there. And so it seems to me, the, 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 the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image means exactly what it says. You don't see relics in this church. You don't see statues in this church. We have used in our literature some pictures to teach children, but you don't see those things here because we don't want to be guilty of that. So here, Jesus Christ appeared to Joshua. The angel of the Lord came to Joshua and it's the same person that was at the burning bush. It was the angel of the Lord that appeared to Moses at the burning bush when Moses approached the bush and God said to him there, take off your shoes from off your feet. The place whereon thou standest is holy ground. You know, we need to have an experience with the Lord. We need to have a salvation experience. We need to know for sure that we have met the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's come into our life and he has saved us. But that's not the only experience we, we need to have. And I firmly believe that if, you, if we stay close to him, we will have experiences with the Lord all through our life. And I, you know, we need to have a fresh testimony. I hear people testify. And every time there's a testimony service, we should be quick to get up and testify. Uh, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen? Let's don't be slow to say so. Let's be quick to stand up and, and praise the Lord. And not only here in church, let's, you know, you can't cram it down people's throats. That doesn't work very good. But when we have an opportunity to give praise and honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, let's look for those opportunities and let's give glory to the Lord. Amen? So, you know, when we have a testimony service, we need to be able to testify. But, you know, I, I, when I was growing up and I heard preachers preach about this, that they would say, you know, I hear some people stand up and testify and they, they have pretty much the same testimony. They don't have a fresh testimony. And they, and they preach that we ought to be close to the Lord and we ought to be close enough to the Lord that we have an ex a new experience with Him every little bit, that we have a new testimony for Jesus and what He's doing in our life. Is God doing something today in your life? Is God, has God done something this past week in your life? Has he touched you? Have, you? have you started to do something and the Lord said, stop it, go pray? Have you, have you been doing something and the Lord said, I want you to witness to this person? We ought to be close enough to the Lord to have an ex a new experience with the Lord often. I don't say every day. We ought, to, we ought to certainly pray every day. We ought to certainly try to draw close to him every day, read our Bible every day. But we need a new experience with God. Have you had, how long has it been since, you, since you've been, I don't mean necessarily this altar, in your home, 
How long has it been since you knelt at a place and, and just prayed until you've been touched by the Holy Spirit? Until the Spirit of God has moved your heart. That's what you need. That's what I need. That's what the church needs today. We need revival. And it only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. The second uh, thing I would give you is Joshua met the real captain of the Lord's host. Verse 14. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. And said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? The angel of the Lord identified himself as captain of the host of the Lord. Now, as I said a moment ago, we know this is Jesus and Joshua worshiped him. And so here was the Old Testament Joshua meeting the New Testament Joshua, or the Old Testament Jesus meeting the New Testament Jesus. And he said, who are you? Are you for us? Now, he evidently didn't recognize him. Sometimes we don't recognize Jesus, do we? Sometimes we don't recognize what he's doing in our life. Sometimes we think it's bad when all the time he's working out good. We have to learn to see God in our life. And folks, let me tell you, we often see him more when we look for him and when we trust in him and when we lean on him. We often see him more in the hard times of our life than we do in the good times of our life. And praise the Lord for the good times, for the rejoicing times, for the happy times. But praise the Lord also for the, for the times of testing that we go through that teaches us to lean on Him and to trust in Him. And so the, the thing is here, He came to Joshua, and Joshua at first didn't seem so. He thought maybe, I don't know, maybe he thought he was uh, from Jericho. They were getting ready to uh, attack Jericho. Uh, as far as Joshua was concerned at this point. Maybe he thought he was a soldier from Jericho. He didn't know who he was. And he said, well, who are you? Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And, and this person said, nay, I am captain of the host of the Lord. In other words, I'm not, for, I'm not for this side and I'm not for that side. I'm for the side that's following the Lord. Somebody said, I'm not sure if it was Abraham Lincoln, somebody once said, it's not, it's, it's not so much whose side the Lord is on, or excuse me, it's not so much whose side the Lord is on, but who, who's on the Lord's side. We need to be on God's side. You know, the way to do that is we have to bring our life into focus. We have to be willing to change. I preach this, I preach this ever since day one I started preaching the Word of God. I used to have a sign, I'm going to get it up here again someday. If you don't come to church to change, Isn't that why we come? We want to be better than who we are. And yet when the Holy Spirit knocks on our door, we back up and say, oh no, I don't want that. I like what I'm doing. I like myself as I am. I don't want to change right now. Folks, if you don't come to change, if you come to hear the Word of God, you're coming to change. You want God to make out of you what He wants you to be. You want to be the woman He wants you to be. You want to be better than you are now. He saved you out of the awful mire of sin. He saved me out of the awful mire of sin. He saved us to make us into saints. He shed His blood so we could be what He wants us to be. Don't back up at that. Let God do in your life what He wants to do. Let me ask you a question. The, this person told Joshua, he said... Nay, I am captain of the Lord's host. In other words, Joshua, you think you're the leader of God's people? Well, you are because God's designated you are, but I'm your leader. Let me ask you this question this morning. Who's your leader? You know, Jesus should be the head of every man. Jesus should be the head of every man. Jesus should be the head of every man. You're learning. You're getting there. Forty more years and I'll get you there. Jesus should be the head of every woman. And Jesus should be the head of every child. 
And when you've got a home where Jesus is the head, you've got love. And you've got reverence and you've got total respect. And you've got a wonderful home. But to, to, to have that, so many homes struggle and they fight and they argue. So many homes have problems today because the dad or the husband will not let Jesus be his head. So many homes struggle because the lady of the house, the queen of the home, will not let Jesus be her head. Now our head should be her, a married woman, our head should be her husband. And then Christ. Ultimately Christ and foremost above, above everything. She, pu she puts herself in subjection to her husband because she puts herself in subjection to Christ. She's doing God's will. And I'm telling you when you've got that, the children will obey the parents. There's too much today, too much today where there's no respect. There's no respect in schools. I hear from teachers. I talk to teachers. No respect. No respect. I talk to other people in society, no respect. You know why? Because people don't know their Bible. You know why this country's in such a mess today? It's that people do not study their Bible. They do not, listen to me, they do not know what is right. You think these people that's out rioting in the streets? And there may be some just causes for some of that. I'm not saying there's not. I think a lot of it is just a mess, just people kind of causing trouble. But there, there may be some just causes. But you know what the problem is? Those people do not trust God. They do not have a Bible, and if they have a Bible, they don't read it. But they do not know what is right and wrong. You and I do not know what is right and wrong this morning unless we open God's Word and we read God's Word. This book will tell you what's right and wrong. And it will tell you when this preacher's wrong. And it will tell you when you're wrong. Our job is to change. Our job is to let Jesus be our captain. Is he your captain this morning? You know, the Lord came to Joshua here as the captain of the Lord's host. And he came with a plan. Here is where you need to have read that next chapter. If you haven't done that, I, I challenge you to read these two chapters together. But the Lord told Joshua how to defeat the mighty city of Jericho. Now, Jericho was a great and powerful city in Canaan. It, I don't know if it was the most powerful city there. We don't know a really, uh, I mean, we know some uh, geological facts about it. Uh, there's been a lot of excavation there. And you know, the, uh, the, the world, I, was th I told Brother Nathan the other day, I said, you know, I've been thinking, I've been reading about uh, when I was preparing this message, I was reading about uh, Jericho and all the, all the people who said, you know, that it couldn't have happened the way the Bible said. It, uh, first of all, they said it wasn't there and so on and so forth. You know, most of the facts that prove the Bible to be true have been dug up by geologists, geologists who, who say they went out to prove it wrong. And it, they didn't, some of them didn't get, get, a lot of them didn't get converted but in what, they've, in what they've discovered proved the Bible was right. In fact, most of the things that we have that prove the Bible is right are people who try to prove it wrong. Shouldn't that say something to people? But here was, here was a powerful city in Canaan, Canaanite city. Uh, the best I can discern, it was about nine acres big altogether. There were actually two walls that surrounded it. And it would have covered today Oh, about uh, three and a half blocks. The walls were all together about 46 feet high. Now, that's pretty, a pretty tall wall. Uh, there was an earth retaining wall in front of the back wall that stood on about 14 feet high, that stood 14 feet high. And on top of the retaining wall at the base was a stone wall about 26 feet high. All together, the top wall stood about 46 feet above ground level and was about six feet thick. I kind of think I know what Joshua was doing out there. He looked at that and said, how are we going to do it? To take that city just by charging like an army does 
might have cost them thousands of soldiers. I don't know. But it would have cost them a whole lot of people. But the captain of, of the host of the Lord came to Joshua and said, Joshua, I've got a plan. If you follow my plan, you can take that city. And, as, and I've searched my Bible. As far as I can see, God's people took that city and never lost a soldier. Now you think about the miracle of that. The wall fell down. That's one miracle. But they still had to fight their way in there. And as far as I can see, they never lost a soldier. So here we are. The captain of the Lord's host came to Joshua, who was leader of God's people, scratching his head, looking at that great big 46-foot wall, saying, how in the world are we ever going to take that? And the captain of the host of the Lord said, well, just do what I tell you. Here's the way you're going to do it. You're going to play some music. Just want you to march around it seven times. And on the seventh day, you're going to march around it seven times. You're going to blow the, you're going to blow the ram's horn as you go around it. And then on the last day, you're going to blow it, and, you're going to, and all the people are going to shout, and then walls are going to fall. That takes a lot of faith. But they did it. And when we stand on God's word, it works. We prayed for some people here for last week. The elders of the church prayed for them. Anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise them up. Amen. Stand on God's word. Because it's true. God's word is true. When we follow the Lord's plan, there is victory. And people suffer when they don't follow God's plan. Can you imagine what would have happened if Joshua would have said, well, you know, I can see part of that. We can march around that place, but we're going we're to have to. That seventh day, we, they know you're blowing them, blowing them horns and them people shouting. We're just going to charge it. They lost thousands of people. You can't do part of God's plan. You can't live by part of the Bible. It won't work. God expects us to do all of what he tells us to do. And he don't say it's easy. Amen? It's not easy to follow the Lord. It takes dedication. It takes surrender to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we're going to follow him, if we're going to, if he's our Savior and if he's our Lord, we're going to dedicate our life to him. I believe when you come to the altar and give your life to Christ and you get saved, you accept him not only as your Savior, but you accept him as your Lord and you pledge to follow him no matter what. Are you doing that? Who's your captain today? Is, is, is it you? Are you the one who makes up your mind what you're going to do? Or do you pray about it? And do you pray about it in earnest and say, Lord, here's the situation. How do you want me to handle this? And are you willing to surrender your life to Christ and do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do? And I'm going to tell you something. He won't tell you something easy. Most of the time. But I'll tell you something. He'll, do, he'll tell you something a whole lot easier than if you refuse and don't follow him. There's people all over the country out here that's living life their own way. There's people all over the country that's not in this church this morning. There's backslidden Christians not in this church this morning. They're, they're trying to live half of God's plan or part of God's plan. It won't work. All they're doing is making themselves and everybody else miserable. All they're doing is hurting other people, hurting themselves. There's unsaved people who don't come to church and don't follow the Lord because they just simply don't believe it. And I, I really believe this today. I mentioned this to you before. We need to get a good old-fashioned dose of what hell is. Amen. What's keeping people away from church is they don't believe in hell. Jesus preached more about hell than he did about heaven. Jesus did. The kindest person who ever walked on this earth preached more about hell they preached about heaven. 
because he knew this one fact, one thing. If people believe in hell and understand there really is a hell and people really are going to go there, they'll get, they'll get saved. I don't want to go to hell. Now, in a loving way, in a caring way, when we're witnessing to people, we need to help them to understand hell is real. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, that he, but he that doeth the will of my Father. It's not people who say, I, I'm a Christian. I've been baptized. I go to church every Sunday. Praise God for people who are in church every Sunday. I just, I want people, you know, I preach that all the time. Be there, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. If you're a child of God, and you're not in church, and you can be in church, and you decide not to be in church, that is sin. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The Word of God says that. When we give ourselves to Jesus Christ, we better mean it. God will hold us to that. And people say, well, you know, I'm done my Well, go ahead. You're hurting yourself. And you're hurting the church. And you're hurting your family. And you're hurting other people. I... Uh, I had a friend many years ago, a really, really good friend. I don't know where he is today. He, he did live in Chicago a while. We were in the National Guard together, and that's where I met him, and that's where we became very close friends. This man had about as good a heart as anyone I've ever known. At that time, he was not saved. Later, I got saved, got saved. He came to our church and got saved. But then he came to me and said, I found this woman. I want to get married. I want you, pastor, to perform the ceremony. And I think maybe the hardest thing I ever said was no. I said, I can't do that. He didn't understand that. I don't marry someone. I don't marry people. You know, I've come to the place I really don't hardly marry anyone except people who are in the church. I've been lied to a lot of times. I started out, I married some people that, and I didn't have the teaching I should have had and uh, Lehman Strauss wrote a little book on prophecy and he mentioned in there, preacher, you better think about the people you marry. And I prayed about that and I thought about that. And I came to the place where I thought, no, if people aren't saved, if they don't want to start their married life out with Jesus, I, I can't be a part of what they're doing. I love them. I love this man. I love him today. He'd call me today and say, Frank, I need help. I'd go. I'd go. I loved him then. But when I said no, I'm sorry, and I tried, I, I told him, I said, I wish I could, I wish I could, but I can't. And it hurt him, it hurt him clear down to his toes. And it hurt me. And he said, why? With tears coming down his cheeks, he said, why? And I said, Kenny, you're a child of God. And the Bible says you should marry a child of God. And I can't be a part of it if you're not going to follow the Lord's will. If you know beforehand. Now, a lot of people, there's probably people in this congregation who got married and didn't understand all this. That's okay. Even if you got married and you did understand, if you've repented of it, God will forgive you. Amen? If you really mean it. But when we repent, we've got to mean it. We've got to live for the Lord from that point on. Amen? But I talked to him. We sat there in that car. It was right outside the armory there, the National Guard armory. And I talked to him for an hour, and I, I prayed with him. And he said, well, I still love you, Frank. But I don't understand it. And I've tried to counsel people who... Uh, I don't really don't know what to tell people sometimes about divorce and remarriage. I leave that in their hands and God's. I tell them, here's a scripture. You read that. You pray over it. And then you do what the Bible and God tells you to do. But this one thing you need to know. 
go to the justice of peace. If you're going to do it, go to the justice of peace and get married. And then you live for the Lord with all your heart. Amen? Amen. There's a lot, of, lot, let me tell you, there's a lot that went into that decision. There's a lot of prayer. And he, Kenny calls me to do a lot of that heart searching. A lot of prayer. But he went ahead and got married to this lady. And she was a nice lady. She was a nice lady. And things went really good. For, for quite, they had, I think, it's two children, two girls. But then things began to go wrong. I don't know the whole story. I know that she began to step out on him. Broke his heart over and over and over. Finally came to the place where he didn't leave her. She left him. Broke his heart over and over. Now, not only did he, not only did he lose her, but he lost the most precious things in his life, those two girls. Well, he got to see them on a weekend. Got to see them on a weekend. I talked to him a lot of times. I talked to another man. Hadn't been all that long ago. He wanted me to marry him, and I wouldn't do it. He got mad at me. I would say seven, eight, nine years of marriage went by. I don't know. But he finally came to me and said, Preacher, you were right. I should have listened to you. You better, you better think about what you're doing. But this man became, his dad was an alcoholic. He, he, knew, he saw what alcoholism does to a family. And he didn't think he would ever be an alcoholic. But today, the last count I had of him, he's living in Chicago, living in an apartment by himself, and he's an alcoholic. When we don't make Jesus the head of our home, the head of our life, when we don't follow the captain of the Lord's host, when he is not our captain, we open ourselves up to tragedy and misery and trouble all through our life. Now, that wasn't a one-time thing. Excuse me. That was not a one-time thing. That, that, it didn't just break his heart one time. He's living with a broken heart today if he's alive. I hope he is. This is serious. You young people, you be careful who you marry. Don't marry, don't marry a guy that drinks. You girls, you boys, don't marry a woman that drinks. She'll destroy your life. Don't marry somebody on drugs. They'll destroy your life. I'm going to say this to you. Don't marry somebody who's not a dedicated Christian. I'm talking about dedicated. A nominal Christian will hurt you if you're serious about serving the Lord. And if you're not serious about serving the Lord, you will hurt her, him or her. First of all, look at yourself. Jesus has to be the captain of your life before you're a fit husband or a fit wife. And if you're not a fit husband or a fit wife and you're not willing to change, you will hurt your family. God wants to change you. He's been changing me for, I don't know, ever since I was 14 years old. And boy, you had a mess to start with, let me tell you. But you see, when God is the captain, there was Joshua. There was Joshua out there trying to figure out, in my mind, trying to figure out, we can't take that. We're going to lose thousands of soldiers. Thousands. And the Lord came. You know how God always shows up? When we're right with the Lord. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? When we're right with the Lord and the devil gets us in between a rock and a hard spot and there's trouble that we don't know how to handle, who shows up but Jesus? Old Peter had sold the Lord out. <laughs> Old Peter, he, Peter he'd, he'd cursed and said, I don't know him. Went fishing. I go fishing. Who showed up? 
on the shore. Who is that man? Amen. Amen. God will always show up, folks, if we follow him. The last thing this morning. Joshua was standing in the presence of God. Verse 15 says, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Oh, the best part of that verse to me is Joshua did so. Joshua did so. What are you doing this morning? Are you following the Lord's will? Is that what's most important to you? Or is it something else? Something that you have as an idol in your life that you, that you pay more attention to, that you obey more and rules your life more than Jesus. You see, this was the same person that appeared to others throughout the Bible. He, he appeared, to, he appeared uh, as the angel of the Lord to uh, uh, Haggai. Well, thou, Lord, seest me. He appeared to Moses. Uh, he appeared to, excuse me, to Moses, to Abraham. All through the Bible, Jesus has shown up. There's a reason for that. It's called the kingdom of heaven. Someday I'll preach on that. But you see, what we understand, what need to understand is Jesus is God. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I just read the first four verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll be done about an hour. Verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, first four verses. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. That verse says Jesus was there all the way through the Old Testament. He is the angel that the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to send my angel before you. See that you listen to him. If you listen to him, he'll bless you. If you don't listen to him, you're going to have trouble. You have that same guidance today, Christian. If you're here and you're not saved, you need to be saved. So you can have that guidance. But so many times we as Christians, we get saved and we kind of let up. We kind of think, well, now I've got it made. We don't have it made till we get to heaven. But you see, if we, if we let the Lord guide us, we can have victory. This Jesus came and appeared to Joshua, and if I can put it in my own words, this is what he was saying to him. I got a plan. I got victory. You follow my plan, I'll give you victory. You don't follow my plan, you're going to have all kinds of trouble. There's people, Christian people in churches all across this country that's having all kinds of trouble today because they're not following God's plan and they don't have victory. They're selfish. They need to get on the altar. I've been there. I'm still get there once in a while. I can still be selfish. If you don't believe it, ask my wife. We have to go to Calvary, don't we? Yeah. Sometimes we've got to go back to Calvary. Yeah. What an experience. I want you to see this. This is what this sermon's about. I want you to see Joshua, the leader of God's people, in a position he didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to be man enough to fill that position. He was taking the place of Moses. I want you to see that. He was taking the place of Moses. Can you imagine? Can you imagine stepping into Moses' shoes? What those people expect of you what you expect of yourself, the job that you've got to do, and you've got to do it right like Moses did. 
he's out there and he's looking at that wall. I've told my wife so many times, I'm just a little boy trying to do a man's job. So many times in the ministry I felt like I was so inadequate to give people what they need, so inadequate to preach the sermon God wanted me to preach, so inadequate to counsel people, to tell young people, and to carry the, the burden. The little church, I can't imagine what pastors of a large church go through. Little church, it's almost more than a, man, than a, man, than a person can bear. And, and, and you, you don't know what to do. But invariably, you know what happens? You have an experience with God. You go back to Calvary. We went to Israel. If you've never been to Israel, go. Some way, somehow, go. I won't get off on that. If I had it to do over and I start in the ministry, I'd go if I had to borrow every penny and pay it off over a lifetime. I don't believe in borrowing money if I don't have to, but as an experience, there's none like it. None like it. I'd probably rather go to college and go, I'd probably rather go to Israel than go to college. It meant that much to me. We went to the garden tomb. They, they got two places. The Catholics have a place. They build churches over a thing. You can't tell if it's right or wrong. I know why they did it. They did it to preserve the place. and Maybe that's good. But they have Gordon's Calvary. We went to both places. Personally, I believe it was Gordon's Calvary, but they say it. probably not. I don't know. But just leave me alone. To me, it was. We went down this, because we went in, we went in the gate, and he sits back there, back there. There's the, there's the hill called Calvary, and right beside of it, down below a little bit, is the garden tree. So we walked, it's just a little garden, it's not very big, not much bigger than this, well, maybe twice this church. But we walked down that path, and somehow I kind of got behind, I, I I don't know what happened. I kind of got behind. Little old path, just wide enough for a person to walk through there, and then you go get some bleachers, and they tell you about it. But before we got to the bleachers, I walked around this path, and I turned this corner, and I looked up, and there was Calvary. And I froze. I literally, and I'm going to tell you something. It takes a lot. It takes a lot. to do that to me. But I looked up, and whether that's a real place or not, I don't know, but it, God made it real to me that day. And I stood there. I froze in the middle of a step, had both feet on the ground, but I was, I, well, my feet were apart. I was getting ready to, to take another step, and I literally froze. There was the place where my Savior was crucified and shed his blood for me. I'm going to tell you something. I had an experience that day. I'd been to Calvary already. I was saved. I got to go back after that even, and it was still the next time I went. And the next time I went. I've been there three times. It was the same every time. We sometimes need a new experience with God. Joshua was out there. He said, I don't know how to do this. I've got to, I've got to lead these people like Moses led them. I've got to take that city. I can't lose 10,000 soldiers. Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. And they looked over there. And there stood the answer. Lift up your eyes, folks. The answer is right in front of you. God is there. Who's your captain? Who's leading you this morning? I hope it's Jesus. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Father, we come to you and we thank you for today and praise you for these fine people. And Lord, we ask you that you'll just draw us all ever closer to you. Help us to love each other, care about each other, pray for each other. Lord, we just ask that you'll be with us. And Father, we just praise you for all you do. 
Now just take over this service. Have your way in our hearts that we can just let Jesus be our captain. Help us to be willing to change. Help us to surrender our whole heart to Christ and to follow thee and to follow thy plan for our lives. In Jesus' name, give us victory. In Jesus' name, amen.